Our food environment is toxic. 95% of the foods that you find in a convenience store or a fast food restaurant are unhealthy, and that's where most Americans are buying their food these days. It's very hard to ask an American to be healthy when 95 out of 100 choices he or she are confronted with are bad. I do want to start with your whole journey with health and wellness, because you mentioned right now that you did this whole biking tour. Tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> well, to be honest, it's, it's not a journey of health and wellness. Uh, I'm more of a truant. You know, mm -hmm. well, well, everybody else my age, university graduates were off doing useful and productive things. I, I biked from Alaska to Argentina. I biked around the world through Russia and I biked the length and width of Africa, but they weren't necessarily health pursuits as much as they were just raw curiosity and mm -hmm. uh, a hunger to understand, to explore the world, understand the world. And to a certain extent, uh, yeah, I was a writer, but very interested in taking those experiences and metabolizing them into stories that I could write about. And it, that turned out to be excellent groundwork for what I do with Blue Zones because uh, yeah, I learned how to interact with people and bring their stories out. I learned a certain empathy for people who have less than we do and an ability to, to uh, I guess, endear myself to them. Uh, but then I also learned how to write about it. And, mm. and that all began, you know, riding my bicycles into villages in Siberia and the Congo and distilling out the things that uh, would interest other people. That's incredible. I don't take that curiosity for granted because I think that it's not easy to lean into it, especially when you're a fresh graduate from college or university. I think that there's so much pressure to go and figure out your life. So that ability to go and say, no, I'm just going to go out there and explore. Is that something that was instilled in you as a child? Because I mean, I have three kids, so I'm trying to understand how do I, you know, Yes, it's, it's hard. Plant that seed. Well, it's bucking a trend. You know, and there's a number of people in your position who go off, and I've reviewed their books, mothers and, and, and couples who've said, we're going to have our venture of our own, and they go abroad for a year. Mm. But I had a father, who, by the way, I just had breakfast with, uh, who instead of taking us to Disney World would take us to the Boundary Waters, and we would canoe out into the wilderness through lakes and rivers and portages and be out in the middle of nowhere for two weeks at a time. And, you know, we had to fish and, and, um, so he was fire. creating the environment to foster That's right. that curiosity. And then I, I, I sold, we didn't have money, but I sold newspaper subscriptions and got really good at it and won trips. So by the time I was 14 years old, I was, you know, my parents had never been on a, a plane in their life. And here I'm jetting off to Hawaii and Spain and Africa as a 14 year old. And it's such a valuable experience. And I hope, you know, parents, mothers do this for their children, you know, kind of let them go and have an experience because they get a certain amount of self-confidence and a certain amount of self-reliance that they they won't get if their parents' eyes are, I mean, my, you know, as a 14 year old, my mom's, let me go to Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was slightly chaperoned, but it taught me how to take care of myself to a certain extent. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, that gives you the courage to go off and follow your dreams in lots of different realms. It's very interesting that you brought up that point because I had a conversation yesterday with a friend of mine about how I left home very early on. And my first trip was to Paris when I was 16. And then that same year, I went to Japan for three months by myself. And it was such an incredible opportunity for me to understand who I was. And the conversation we we're having with my friend, she was saying how, you know, right now, a lot of parents trying to create that environment of curiosity. So a lot of them pulling kids out of the school, go travel, but there's something very magical about, to your point, not having to experience the world through the parents' kind of point of view. Because even when you travel with your kids, you're still kind of creating a specific environment for them, right? They're seeing things through our eyes a little bit. So it's, it's very different, um, but it's, it's funny that you mentioned that reminded me. I would love to know how you got into the whole Blue Zone project, where did it start? Well, in, in a sense, it started with those bike rides. 
from there, I went, uh, I started a company that specialized in solving great ancient mysteries. And I had a full-time team of 14 people, including archaeologists and biologists and National Geographic photographers and writers. And we figured out how to, in a sense, harness the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, we, the very first laptop computers and demilitarized satellite dishes, we would go to a part of the world say Central America, with a mission to figure out why the Maya civilization collapsed. Oh. And we, every day we let our, we had an online uh, audience of about a million people. They voted to decide where we, we'd go, we'd find clues, and we would let the, our huge audience help us figure out what those clues meant. You know, and sometimes it was a retired uh, scientist who s sits in an armchair and, you know, had this insight and sometimes a 12 year old kid, but, um, we got very good at, at networking with top experts, harnessing the wisdom of the crowd and solving problems. And then in 1999, I stumbled upon a very interesting mystery, Okinawa, Japan, uh, islands in, in the Southern part of Japan were producing the longest lived disability free people in the world. So these are people living a long time without diseases. And I said, aha, mm. that's a good mystery. And the very first Blue Zone expedition was really part of this mystery solving uh, business I was in. They were called Quest. If you, if you Google Maya Quest or Africa Quest, you can see some of these expeditions we did. But, um, you, know, we, you know, we do these expeditions, you know, twice a year. But, you know, we had such a phenomenal response from what we were finding in Okinawa um, that the situation was such a few years later that I really wanted to focus deeply and take on this mystery. And, and um, it was really 2004 that we launched Blue Zones in earnest. Was there any research or any project that was already kind of ongoing that you built on top of, or you really started from nothing with just bringing in all the questions and kind of like the Western, you know, journey to discovering what's going on in that region. Did anyone started it before you? There were versions. In 1974, National Geographic did a story about three places, the Vilcabamba Valley of Ecuador, the Hunza Valley in Pakistan, and the Caucasus in the former Soviet Union, where they were reputed to have high concentrations of 100-year-olds. Mm. And he, uh, he went there uh, and he traveled to these places and he just had some anecdotal interactions and he wrote this very popular story, but it's all, it was all debunked. Oh. Um, but, you know, that kind of gave the seeds to the idea. But I, I found this place in Okinawa and it occurred to me there must be other places there must be places in maybe africa or europe or south america that are producing extraordinarily long-lived people and that maybe if i could find them and look for their common denominators mm -hmm. or their correlates and once you dig into the academic literature it turns out there's lots of people in the world who are studying this so um in sardinia italy uh, a small island off the coast of italy um, there was a scientist named Gianni Pess who found a cluster of five villages in what he called the blue zone mm. that were producing more male centenarians than any place else in the world. And Okinawa was mostly female centenarians. And um, so I went to National Geographic magazine and I said, you know, I'm finding some really interesting things here. And they, and they assigned me a big story to, to cover it. And uh, I got a grant from the National Institutes on Aging. And with that grant, I, I hired demographers. And demographers are uh, experts in looking at populations. Mm. And uh, working with them, we found uh, five areas eventually, five blue zones where people were living the longest. And that's painstaking work. And you have to, you have to check ages and, and you have to uh, verify people are as old as they say they are. But once you find areas where people are living statistically longest, um, then the rest is really an exercise in reverse engineering mm -hmm. to find out what these populations have in common that uh, explain longevity. And remarkably, no matter where you go and you find people living a long time, 
the situation is the same in all places. And that's what I think people should pay attention to. So what are those commonalities? Well, first of all, they don't exercise, which is shocking, I think. People think, well, you're going to exercise to health, but nobody in blue zones are exercising. But you look a little deeper and you see that they're moving all the time. They live in places where every time they go to work or out to eat or a friend's house, it's a, it occasions a walk. Mm -hmm. They have gardens out back all the time. You'll probably remember this from Russia. I know you're yeah. big gardeners and your dachas and so forth, mm -hmm. but uh, everybody in the blue zone works a garden until you're 80, 90, and 100. And also their houses weren't full of mechanical conveniences that have engineered physical activity out of their lives. They're still kneading bread by hand, which is a big workout, or cleaning their houses by hand, or doing garden work and yard work by hand. And we don't do that anymore. But when you look at it in blue zones, because of this, they're moving every 20 minutes or so. Uh, and they're keeping their metabolism at a much higher uh, level than we would if, you know, you sit around all day long at your desk or at home and then think you're going to make it up in the gym, which first of all, uh, <laughs> you never, most of the time we don't make it up at the gym. And second of all, that's not the way we evolved or the way we evolved as human beings, as mammals is you, you know, our ancestors were moving all the time. That's just a healthier way to do it. So, but to find out what they eat, if you want to know what a centenarian or a hundred year old ate to live to be a hundred, mm -hmm. You have to know what she was eating when she was a little girl and when she was middle aged and, and newly retired. So to get at that, we aggregated what are called dietary surveys that the governments do or universities do that give you a snapshot of what the whole population was doing, eating in, say, 1940 and 1950, 1960, 1970. And we found 155 of these dietary surveys done in all five blue zones. And then through a process called meta-analysis, it's sort of an averaging, mm -hmm. we found out what people really eat to live to be 100, very high carbohydrate diet. People say, what, aren't carbohydrates unhealthy? Well, uh, one kind of carbohydrate is simple carbohydrates, like you know, pastries and, and uh, candy and so forth. But complex carbohydrates are the healthiest foods in the world. And in blue zones, they're essentially eating five foods their whole life. Whole grains, be uh, corn, rice, and wheat. Greens and garden vegetables. Tubers, like sweet potatoes. Mm -hmm. In Okinawa, until 1970, about 65% of all the calories they consumed came from purple sweet potatoes. Very interesting longevity food. Snacking on nuts, if you're eating a handful of nuts a day, it's probably adding two years to your life expectancy. And the cornerstone of every longevity diet in the world is beans. And if you're I know eating- you're a, a big bean guy. I'm a big bean guy. I'm the <laughs> self-anointed king of beans. But I can tell you, yeah. if you're eating a cup of beans a day, uh, it's worth about four extra years of life expectancy over eating less healthy protein. Wow. Uh, great source of fiber, great source of protein, great source of folates, full of micronutrients, complex carbohydrates. And guess what? Everybody can afford beans. Mm. And most ethnicities know how to make them taste delicious. Whether you're African Americans with a hop and john or Latin Americans with beans and tortillas and, and, um, or, yeah, Mediterranean pasta and fagioli. Was it surprising to you the level of simplicity once you started looking into it? Because I just feel like now we live in a world, I mean, I know you've been doing this research for about 20 years, right? The whole project. But we live now in a world that just feels so complex to stay healthy in, you know, to feel good, to age well, um, even though we have all the tools, in front of us. Like I know life expectancy went up in the US, but also disease rate went up in the US, right? I think I read a study where 60% of Americans has at least one chronic illness. Yeah. So it, there's just such a, just it just feels harder. But then when you look at the blue zones and your work, everything just feels simpler and kind of like, yeah, of course it's, that, you know, that's straightforward. Um, where is that discrepancy you feel 
for us here in the U.S. that we can't kind of go back to basics? Several things. Uh, number one, I think we're misled often that the um, things that actually help us live a long time are not things that marketers can make money at. For example, you know, there's a lot of there's not a lot of money in beans. Yeah, it there's not a lot of money good. in broccoli. Not a lot of money in in corn tortillas. So. Where the money is, is highly processed food. So about 60% of the calories we consume in America is highly processed. And it, it almost always has, or often has, a health problem. 100% organic, omega-3, fatty acids added, superfood. People in blue zones lived in an environment where it was much easier to get around on foot. And, you know, we live in Miami and it's it's almost impossible. I mean, if you live in the southern tip of South Beach, you can or you may you walk in your neighborhood a little bit, but everybody gets in a car here. Mm -hmm. And we instead of getting that very important physical activity, you know, walking out to eat or letting our kids walk to school, we're on some motorized form of transportation that we sit there and get you know on more unhealthy. Our food environment is toxic. 95% of the foods that you find in a convenience store or a fast food restaurant are unhealthy. And that's where most Americans are buying their food these days. So it's very hard to ask an American to be healthy when 95 out of 100 choices he or she are confronted with are bad. And that's that's not because there's like an, like an evil person orchestrating all of that. It's just that in America, the farm bill subsidizes cheap grains, which are used for feedlot animals, and they're used for the inputs for you know, things like Doritos and high fructose corn syrup for um, soda pops and candy bars. And, and that's what's the cheapest. And big companies like General Mills and Kraft, they take these cheap inputs. They hire brilliant scientists to make them taste irresistible. They spend several a dozen billion dollars with the sharpest minds on Madison Avenue to market them to us. And we, you can't avoid it. It's, it's, it's our food culture. And so we live in this ocean of processed foods and fast food restaurants and superfoods and, and people in blue zones live in a place where the cheapest, most accessible and most delicious foods are peasant foods. Mm -hmm. They come out of their gardens. They're, minestrone with three kinds of beans or a pasta dish with vegetables in it. Not to say that they don't eat meat. Uh, they eat meat about uh, five times a month and they do eat sweets, but sweets and meat are things that they have during celebrations. It's not, you know, bacon for breakfast and, and, or Fruit Loops. How did we, as to me, in order to understand what the future can look like, I need to understand how the past looked like. So how did we get to this point where the standard American diet is going against everything that's good for us? It's not evil. So until about 1970, there weren't enough calories to feed Americans. Uh, so people genuinely went hungry in America. Nobody goes hungry today, or very few people go hungry today. President Nixon turned to his, his uh, Secretary of Agriculture, a guy named Earl Butts, and said, fix this problem. And Earl Butts went about creating this sort of monoculture agriculture where um, it favored uh, corn, wheat, rice, uh, sugar cane, and soybeans, and um, set up, the first of all, the incentives for farmers to quit planting everything else and just farm these and using every inch of their farmland for these five sort of commodities. And then the government created a really effective distribution system. It's important that if you're a farmer living in the middle of Iowa, you can get your crop to market. So mm -hmm. Earl Butts helped facilitate this really great. So subsidize these foods, make it easy to get to market. And all of a sudden, the amount of grain of these cheap junk food input grains uh, tripled in about 10 years. So all of a sudden, there's this huge glut of this grain. And American business does what American business is supposed to do. It innovates and it creates things like Doritos and and uh, granola bars and you know all these other things that are 
that are highly processed that t- take these cheap inputs, but can be made to taste really delicious. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, our USDA allows these marketers to make these health claims that maybe it has one vitamin that's supposedly healthy, but it doesn't mention the 30 grams of sugar. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're duped into thinking like yogurt. Most people think yogurt is good for you. But do you know if you get fruit yogurt that has more sugar in it, ounce for ounce, than Coca-Cola does? Oh, my God. And we feed our babies that. And, well, I'm giving my baby probiotics. And the meanwhile, you're napalming your baby's taste buds and, and sending its insulin into skyrocketing and, you know, already putting them on the path for type 2 diabetes. But we don't realize that because we think, well, we're doing our babies a favor. If the way we're eating today was started because we didn't have enough to eat. Obviously, the reality changed, the landscape changed. Why do you feel there's like no changes in the standard American diet? Just like, okay, this is the reality we live in now. We have to maneuver. We have to change. We have to do something else. Uh, because the the manufactured food industry, the beverage industry, the meat industry, they're all making Sorry. tons of money right yeah. now. And they have... Uh, very powerful lobbyists mm-hmm. uh, that that keep laws being made to curb their their activities, and uh, our politicians aren't courageous enough, or you know they're so desperate to get into office they t- they they're influenced by lobbyists or they take the money, and um, so we continue to marinate in this toxic food environment, and um, and the and the problem is we don't realize. You know, uh, 75% of us are obese or overweight in this country. Wow. 42% of us are obese. And the health care costs associated with that is about $3 trillion. We spend $4.4 trillion. 85% of it comes from avoidable diseases. And, and we don't, we're not allowed to see clearly the connection between the foods that we're eating, our food environment, and our our sickness, the sickness in this country. Mm-hmm. And if, if that were made clear, if we took some of that $4 trillion or so that we're wasting on, on largely avoidable disease, uh, everybody in America could afford to eat incredibly healthy food. And, um, and I'm talking food like the food you'd see at a Whole Foods, for example, mm-hmm. um, you know, fresh produce. And I heard you mention somewhere how the actual cost of that junk food versus, you know, whole foods that we can get. Um, if you look at the bigger picture, right, of the whole ecosystem, it actually is so much more expensive to create these junk foods. It's cheaper to create junk food. It's cheaper to, but if you look at, to create a burger, the amount of, like the ecosystem of it, do you feel like it's cheaper to create something okay, like that? Okay, so if you're than- talking the externalities, which is, so a burger, for example, if if the meat was if the grain it, it takes eleven pounds of grain to weigh, make one pound of beef of, mm-hmm. of burger. So all of those grains are hugely subsidized by our tax dollars, and if if those subsidies weren't there, that that burger would cost about forty dollars. And mm. if you added in the cost of the CO two emissions and the pollution it causes and the antibiotic resistance it helps cause, that hamburger's probably $80. Right. Um, meanwhile, you can eat a delicious, you know, minestrone with tomatoes and onions and celery and carrots, nicely cooked with some beans, finished with some uh, extra virgin olive oil, and that whole bowl of food's going to cost you less than a dollar. Mm -hmm. and provide you all the nutrients that you need. And eating healthy can actually be much cheaper than, first of all, than we think it can. But secondly, even in comparison to eating this this junkier processed foods. And you published um, a couple of cookbooks. The first one was Blue Zones cookbook, which is all the recipes from the Blue Zones that you visited. Um, But one that I really loved was the Blue Zone American Kitchen. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So Blue Zone Kitchen, the first one, was a number one New York Times bestseller. And, you know, even though I never set out to be a food writer, it was clearly that's what people who follow me wanted to see. So 
during the pandemic, I got the idea to try to find America's diet of longevity. And I knew from these meta-analysis, I knew exactly what the longest lived people ate. And then I went looking for American ethnicities that were making it. And I found it among African Americans, mostly in the Southeast here, mm. who were, um, especially the Gullah Geechee people, freed African slaves, among the Latin Americans, beans and corn tortilla, among the Native Americans, uh, who ate very healthy until we showed up, uh, uh, and among Asian Americans, who know how to cook greens and make them taste delicious. And, and most of the original Asian foods are all plant-based with a little bit of meat for as a condiment or as a flavoring. And um, I have a friend who writes for the New York Times named Jeffrey Gordonier, and he helped make some very key introductions. And I hired a producer, and over the course of a year, we found 55 American chefs from Hawaii to Maine to Miami and, uh, and then up into uh, Northern California and um, took a National Geographic photographer, David McLean, and we gathered the, the best recipes. We probably found 400 and winnowed it down to 100 and met the chefs, watched them cook it, captured the recipes, captured the photography, and I put it into Blue Zone American Kitchen. Amazing. Because I feel sometimes it feels like we talk often about how all the things that are wrong, you know, in our country and in terms of diet and all these things, and it kind of feels a bit uh, negative. So if you could take all that wisdom and learnings that you got from visiting those blue zones and bring it here to the American people in you know, in this modern society that live in cities, how would you like advise to implement those blue zones techniques? Yes. So the first thing is to realize that if you want to live longer, don't try to change your behavior or your habits because you'll probably fail. And if you look at the success rate of diets and exercise programs and even taking supplements, it, they only work for people for a number of months. And when it comes to longevity, unless you're thinking of something you're going to do for decades, mm. don't waste your time. There's no pill. There's no supplement. There's no, you know, superfood that you can take every day for a month or or six months even and have it have any impact on how you, long you live. It, it's about small things um, deployed over decades that really work. So... That's why I say don't try to change your behavior, change your environment. For example, uh, I live in the southern tip of South Beach. Every time, it's way easier for me to just walk to a restaurant or walk to my bike to a grocery store or walk to the beach than it is to get in my car. Mm -hmm. And that's because I, I chose a walkable environment. Um, so... You know, if you really care about the health of your children and your own health, you will make sure you're living in a walking environment, a neighborhood with sidewalks, with trees overhead, uh, with traffic that's going by slowly. We call it a road diet instead of traffic going by really quickly. Parents don't like their children near uh, traffic, and you're also about four or five times more likely to get asthma if you're living near traffic. Um, the second thing you can do is think about who you're spending time with. If your three best friends are obese and unhealthy, there's about 150% better chance that you'll be overweight. If your, if your friends drink a lot, you're 70% more likely to, to be abusing alcohol. Even unhappiness and loneliness is measurably contagious. So about the best thing you can do is, I call it curating your immediate social circle. Uh, be very proactive about finding three to five friends who this idea of recreation is pickleball or walking or gardening, uh, friends who care about you on a bad day, mm. who keep your brain engaged, friends who um, it's not a bad idea to have a vegan or vegetarian in your immediate social circle because they're going to teach you how and where to find plant-based food. And, um, you know, if all your friends, for example, all they ever do is sit around a barbecue and eat wieners and hamburgers, guess what you're going to eat? 
Yeah. Um, curating that social circle, movement's going to be unconscious. Mental engagement, unconscious. A caring friend environment, unconscious. Eating plant-based food. Every time you go out to eat with them, they're going to make sure you're at a restaurant where there's a delicious plant-based entree. Every time you go over to their house, they're going to be serving you plant-based food. And every time they come to your house, they're going to expect you to learn how to make it and serve it to them. And it's that kind of unconscious environmental approaches that really work for longevity because friends are long-term adventures. Mm -hmm. Where you live, and uh, moving to a walkable neighborhood is long-term. If you really care, that's what you'll do. If you look at people who join gyms, most people tend to join gyms around the first of the year. Um, New Year's, this, this year I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to lose that 10 pounds. <laughs> and if you look at the data, the vast majority are no longer going to the gym three months later. Yeah. And nine months later, fewer than a third of them are still going. So we, we sign up for the same insanity every year. And we get the same result every year. I was very surprised, and I don't know if you were when you started your research, that a huge pillar of longevity is, to your point, the community and the environment you surround yourself in. Uh, when I watched the documentary, it very much like the main thing that stood up for me because I was as all of us kind of accustomed to think, there is this magic pill or mag magic food or magic workout. Um, but it was very comforting for me to see that the aspect of community is so detrimental to our health. Did you expect the to find that? The lack of community. Yeah, the lack of community on this side of the world, yeah. yeah. Uh, did, would you ex did you expect to find that in your when you went out there looking for the reasons for those? Blue zones? No, no. No. When I went looking, I was thinking I was going to find a compound, coral calcium, or I was going to find some amazing herb. Mm -hmm. That's I didn't know. That's what I thought I'd find. But you start seeing that, well, in Okinawa, for example, they have these committed social circles. Like you have children. When you turn five, your mom uh, with other moms in a village – couple you with four or five other children and you're put in something called a moai and you're expected to travel through life together. They become they're your appointed best friends, so to speak. And when things go well for you, you get a raise or there's a good crop, you're expected to share it. On the other hand, when things go poorly, a parent dies, you get divorced, uh, ch a child gets sick, you have this, you run out of money, you have this group of friends that uh, help you through the tough times. And, you know, I identified that in 2005. My book or a cover story for National Geographic is one of the longevity. Of, nobody paid any attention to that. Yeah. Now we know that loneliness, not having that group, uh, our, our, it's a major um, focus of our Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy. And we now know that being lonely in America uh, shaves about eight years off of your life expectancy. It's as bad for you as a smoking habit. So you know, nobody's paying attention. Same thing with purpose. We know people who can articulate their sense of purpose live about seven years longer than people who are rudderless. Mm -hmm. And the, the way we know that is, is uh, the National Institutes on Aging did a study that looked at the writings of, of people 30 years ago and followed them for several decades. And, and those people whose writing... Uh, articulated a per sense of life meaning, uh, we're surviving seven years longer than those who are, well, I don't know what I'm doing on this earth, or they're kind of rudderless. So that's, you look at the purpose literature, purpose is not only a great strategy for happiness, it's a great strategy for living longer. When I came to Miami, the whole wellness, biohacking, longevity industry I found out about it when I moved here. I didn't know it was such a thing. I feel like in Miami, everyone is trying to yeah. stay young forever. Do you, have you noticed that? Yes. That it's so big and... Especially the richer you are, the, the more you're trying to spend to get it healthier, recapture the fleeting youth. Yes, and there's been so many different articles recently of all these wealthy people that are doing these insane things. Where do you stand in terms of like the whole biohacking world? Well, I have a doctor here in uh, Miami, Dr. Wolf, 
and he says, uh, he, he has this talk, he does around town, and he points out that the people who get the worst health care in America are the poorest people and the richest people. And why the richest people? Because they're taking these crazy risks with their body, it's trying these experimental stem cells and and Black plasmas. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and none of these things have been proven or even shown in humans to uh, reverse, stop, or slow aging. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet we're so desperate to recapture it. And you know, part of the reason is we live in a culture that idolizes youth, whereas in blue zones, mm -hmm. they idolize you know when you're older. But if you want to live longer, I don't endorse any of these rapamycin or, or metformin or stem cells or any, none of these things have been shown to work. Eat your beans if you want to live longer. Well, that's to me, I guess, my train of thought is like, let's first do the basics and see where we land doing these things, right? Of just building the environments, creating the community, eating the simple food. And then maybe after, if that's not good enough, we can start looking into all this science and whatever it is that's happening right now with the biohacking. The other thing is to realize that we are mammals and every mammal is, is genetically programmed at a certain play, time to expire and get out of the way for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're listening to us right now and you're an average American with an average set of genes and you do everything right, you should make it to 95. Maybe mm -hmm. a little longer for if you're a young woman, a little bit less if you're an older man. But 95 is what we're, our bodies, our human machines are programmed for. And if you eat low on the food chain, peasant food, and you walk in every day and you live a life of purpose and you're socially connected and you stay away from uh, toxins, uh, your body should deliver you about 95 years. Now, if you're sitting eating burgers and pizzas and watching TV and driving everywhere and constantly stressed and lonely, um, all the anti-aging, biohacking in the world is not going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of these cosmetic things, you know, Botox or, you know, people who do these cosmetic surgery, yeah, you know, they'll make you look younger for an extra half a dozen years or something. And there's nothing wrong with that, I don't think, but these these um, shooting yourself up with plasma or younger people's blood or stem cells, I, I don't think the risk is worth it. And there's no evidence to show that it is. You mentioned staying away from toxins. It feels quite impossible these days. How do you suggest to do that? Don't live near a highway. Eat organic mm -hmm. helps. Um, Pay attention to the types of cleaning and cleansers, things you use to clean your home and your clothes. There's an author named Doug O'Lean, O-L-E-I-N, who wrote a very good book on the toxins in our environment. You can get a hold of that book or follow him on Instagram to get an idea of where those toxins are. But mm -hmm. so and by the way, when you eat meat, remember, people are afraid of soybeans or the toxins that might be in grains. Uh, every time you eat a pound of meat, you're essentially ingesting uh, 11 pounds of toxins or the toxins present in 11 pounds of grain because meat aggregates those toxins. So, you know, stay away from meat as much as you can. This is another thing that I think in order for us to live a better life. We have to have this information and understand. I can take the responsibility, right? Because I mean, the world, or at least where we live in, they are not going to cater to everything that's good to us or bring it forward. Uh, and it brings me to your project, the Blue Zone Project, um, with the certification. Can you tell me a little bit that? You go into cities or schools, right? And you do training in the blue zone? No, it's, it's much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. it, it, we take over a city. You take over a city. So the basic premise of blue zones, if you want to live longer, don't try to change your behavior, change your environment. So we've now been in 72 cities. We're in Florida, we're in Naples, we're in Jacksonville, Fort Worth, Texas, Hawaii, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. And we started with much smaller cities, but we go in with a full-time staff 
and the staff has three different sort of squads. One squad is a policy squad, and we help city councils select policies that favor healthy food over junk food and junk food marketing. Mm -hmm. We favor the pedestrian and the, and the cyclist over the motorist. Uh, not, we're not trying to get rid of all traffic, but we're trying to make roads for human beings and not just big, you know, engine driven vehicles and then favor the non-smoker over the smoker. So we have this process of, of looking at all of these policies with city council and the mayor for effectiveness and feasibility. And then we help these policies get implemented. That makes a huge difference. Yes. The second squad administers a blue zone certification program for all the schools, restaurants, grocery stores, workplaces, and churches. And over the course of our five year stay, we can usually get about 30 to 40% of all those places certified. And when you're a blue zone certified place, healthy food is cheaper and most access, more accessible than the junk food, whether it's school lunches or uh, employee lunches. It's easier to move naturally. Uh, it's easier to socialize and people know their purpose and live their purpose. So we have mm. about 25 different uh, policies and designs that each of these places can implement to get certification and make their places about 20% healthier. And then a third squad, well, they work with about 10 or 15% of the population to become Blue Zones ambassadors. And as a Blue Zone ambassador, we put you through a purpose uh, training. So you identify your sense of purpose and you volunteer. Uh, you um, take you into your home and we show you how to set up your kitchen and your bedroom and the rest of your home so you move more and eat better unconsciously. And then we help you find three or four new friends who have healthy habits to begin with and we help you make friends with them. We really kind of put the training wheels on. So it's people, places, and policy. Five years, we measure it with Gallup. Uh, Gallup measures obesity and, and chronic disease and emotional health. And every city we go in, we're able to lower the obesity rate, lower the chronic disease load, and lift up their life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And we're paid usually by the hospital system or the um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield plan. How do people get or demand that from their cities? Like, how can they bring you guys in? Well, you, you can go to bluezones.com and there's a page, click a page called community and they'll, it'll take you through it. it. It usually takes a really well-connected individual or set of individuals, but ultimately it, it usually requires getting the attention of the mayor and then also getting the attention of a funder because there's no insurance reimbursement in America for keeping people healthy. You only get reimbursed once you get sick or, you know, mm -hmm. diabetic or break something. You, you, you got to be sick in this country for to get help. Uh, economics aren't really set up to keep us healthy in the first place. That's, um, I mean, it's very empowering to me, at least, knowing that there are ways to change the trajectory of our own, you know, life and our children's lives. So if I had to, I'm um, going back to it because I want to wrap up with those very simple steps on health and longevity. We talked about community. We talked about purpose. We talked about food. You're a big plant-based um, advocate. Um, anything else that you can leave this conversation with? Well, I, I want to go back to food for a second because I would say 60% of your health or lack thereof in America is what you're putting in your mouth. So one of the best things you can do right now to start eating healthier is get your hands on a plant-based cookbook. Uh, you know, I have the Blue Zone Kitchen books, but there's lots of other really good ones. And uh, with your family, maybe it's on the weekend, actually cook, go through and find recipes that appeal to you. Mm -hmm. not ones on oh, this would be healthy that you actually think will taste delicious and make them. And once you a acquired the skills for making them have the experience of doing that as a family and learn that you like it, my job is over because you will go, you'll learn that first of all, it's easy. You'll learn to taste better. You'll feel better after the meal. You'll find that you're saving a lot of money as compared to going out or buying processed foods. And, um, uh, and that really acquiring that skill and experience of tasty, whole plant-based food. Uh, and for those people who don't have time to cook, actually, I have 
Blue Zone Kitchen in the in the freezer section of Whole Foods. Oh, amazing! Yeah, you can find. Uh, we actually cook them for you. So, for seven dollars and ninety nine cents, you can have a meal, a Blue Zone meal that fuel your your uh, longevity to to mid nineties or so. And then get really clear on your sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. And I uh, advocate that people actually sit down to a blank screen or a piece of paper even, and you make four columns. One column is my values. Column two is what I'm good at. Column three is what I like to do. And column four is an outlet. And in the first, let's start filling in the first three columns. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm passionate about animals. I like to walk dogs. I'm, I'm good at, well, I'm good with animals. Uh, or I like children. Uh, I am good at, at uh, resolving conflict. I, uh, I like it when I make the peace or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever those things are, your, your values, your passions and what you're good at. And then the fourth column is where there's an outlet for those things. And I can't say enough about the importance of knowing what your purpose is and then having an outlet. And in Blue Zones, it's all, almost always an altruistic. You're doing it for others and taking that focus. We all have 99 problems. Those 99 problems change. You know, I got a new wrinkle or I got a dent in my car. There's always going to be 99 problems. The more focus we put on those 99 problems, the bigger they are. Mm -hmm. The more we shift our focus off of our 99 problems and put them on people with bigger problems than us, the smaller our 99 problems become. And to know our sense of purpose and know where we have an outlet to shift our focus, it's one of the best things you can do for happiness and longevity. It's truly, there's an art to, to living well. And I've only realized it recently as I'm getting older, I'm understanding that the things that I valued or wanted to excel at before is such a small aspect of my well-being and longevity. And I think that slowly I do see that people are starting to wake up to that, to starting to find that balance, that curiosity to learn how to fulfill their lives in other ways than, you know, in a career or different things. Do you see that shift? in the US happening? Maybe it's like a post COVID thing, or maybe it's just my environment. You know, I will say this, this uh, Netflix documentary, Living to 100, the whole four part series is really a celebration of that very of purpose of socially connective, eating low on the food chain, instead of looking to uh, artificial intelligence or technology to solve our problems, that whole series looks back Mm -hmm. to a simpler time and finds um, solutions. And the fact that that's, it's been Netflix, one of its most successful doc, international documentary series ever, tells me there's a hunger for this sort of thing. And um, I, I, I see that as a ray of, of hope. Yes. Dan, thank you so much for bringing more simplicity it's especially for me, because uh, like I mentioned with my wellness and the need to stay young and vital, I was looking into all these different things and it got me a little crazy, you know, um, and starting to get into your uh, just project, your books, the recipes, it just brought me back to, I can do this. This is very manageable and it can be fun and it can be attainable for uh, myself and my family. So I'm sure a lot of other people feel the same. So thank you so much for the work you do. Well, it looks like it's paying off. So yes. thank you for introducing me to your audience. And uh, if anybody has any other questions on Instagram, I'm at Dan Butner, and I'm very happy to answer questions. And it's really been a delight to chat with you. Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't miss my newest episode right here. And if you're listening to the podcast on Apple or Spotify, please go and leave a review with your biggest takeaway. I love reading your thoughts. And if you have any suggestions for guests or topics, you can leave them in the comment section. And always, always remember, you are not alone.